The Sign of the Beaver, Chapter 9 A few mornings later, at the end of the lesson, Matt delayed Etienne. How did you kill that rabbit, he asked, pointing to the offering Etienne had thrown on the table. There's no bullet hole in it. Indian not use bullet for rabbit, Etienne answered scornfully. Then how? There's no hole at all. For a moment, it seemed that Etienne would not bother to answer. Then the Indian shrugged. A tea and show, he said, come. Matt was dumbfounded. It was the first sign the Indian had given of, well, of what exactly? He had not sounded friendly, and there was not time to puzzle this out right now. A tea was walking across the clearing, and he apparently expected Matt to follow. Pleased and curious, Matt hobbled after him, grateful that he no longer needed the crutch. At the edge of the clearing, the Indian stopped and searched the ground. Presently, he stooped down under a black spruce tree, poked into the dirt, and jerked up a long, snake-like root. He drew from the leather pouch at his belt a curious sort of knife. The blade curved into a hook. With one sure stroke, he split one end of the root, then peeled off the bark by pulling at it with his teeth. He separated the whole length into two strands, which he spliced together by rolling them against his bare thigh. Next, he searched about in the bushes till he found two forked saplings about three feet apart. He trimmed the twigs from these, drawing his knife toward his chest as Matt had been taught not to do. Then he cut a stout branch and rested it lightly across the forks of his saplings. From the thread-like root, he made a noose and suspended it from the stick so that it hung just above the ground. He worked without speaking, and it seemed to Matt that all this took him no time at all. Rabbit run into trap, he said finally. Pull stick into bush so white boy can kill. Golly, said Matt, filled with admiration. I hadn't thought of making a snare. I didn't know you could make one without string or wire. Make more, Atian ordered, pointing to the woods. Not too close. After Atian had gone, Matt managed to make two more snares. They were clumsy things, and he was not too proud of them. Splitting a slippery root, he discovered, was not so easy as it had looked. He spoiled a number of them before he mastered the trick of splicing them together. They did not slide as easily as the one Atian had made, but they seemed strong enough. Next morning, he showed his traps to Atian. He had hoped for some sign of approval, but all he got was a grunt and a shrug. He knew that to Atian, his work must look childish. However, on the third day, one of his own snares had been upset though the animal had got away. The day after that, to his joy, there was actually a partridge struggling to free itself in the bushes where the stick had caught. This time, the grunt with which Atian rewarded him sounded very much like his grandfather's good. Silently, the Indian watched as Matt reset the snare. Then they walked back to the cabin, Matt swinging his catch as nonchalantly as he had seen Atian do. You don't need to bring me any more food, he boasted. I'll catch my own meat from now on. Nevertheless, Etienne continued to bring him some offering every morning. Not always fresh meat. He seemed to know exactly when Matt had finished the last scrap of rabbit or duck. Sometimes he brought a slab of corn cake or a pouch full of nuts. Once a small cake of maple sugar. Plainly, he felt bound to keep the terms of his grandfather's treaty. Matt stuck to his part of the bargain as well, though the lessons were an ordeal for both of them. Matt knew well enough what a poor teacher he was. Sometimes it seemed that Atian was learning in spite of him. Once the Indian had resigned himself to mastering 26 letters, he took them in a gulp, scorning the childish candle and door and table that Matt had devised. Soon he was spelling out simple words. The real trouble was that Atian was contemptuous that the whole matter of white man's words seemed to him nonsense. Impatiently, they hurried through the lessons to get on with Robinson Crusoe. Matt suspected that the only reason Atian agreed to come back day after day was that he wanted to hear more of that story. Skipping over the pages that sounded like sermons, Matt chose the sections he liked best himself. Now he came to the rescue of the man Friday. Atian sat quietly and Matt almost forgot him in his own enjoyment of his favorite scene. There was a mysterious footprint on the sand, the canoes drawn up on the lonely beach, 
and the strange, wild-looking men with two captives. One of the captives they mercilessly slaughtered. The fire was set blazing for a cannibal feast. Then the second captive made a desperate escape, running straight to where Crusoe stood watching. Two savages pursued him with horrid yells. Matt glanced up from the book and saw that Atian's eyes were gleaming. He hurried on. No need to skip here. Caruso struck a mighty blow at the first cannibal, knocking him senseless. Then, seeing that the other was fitting an arrow into his bow, he shot and killed him. Matt read on. The poor savage who fled but had stopped, though he saw both his enemies fallen, yet was so frightened with the noise and fire of my peace that he stood stock still and neither came forward nor went backward. I hallooed again to him and made signs to him to come forward, which he easily understood, and came a little way, then stopped again. He stood trembling as if he had been taken prisoner and just been to be killed as his two enemies were. I reckoned to him again to come to me and gave him all the signs of encouragement that I could think of. And he came nearer and nearer, kneeling down every 10 or 12 steps in token of acknowledgement for saving his life. I smiled at him and looked pleasantly and beckoned to him to come still nearer. At length, he came close to me and then he kneeled down again, kissed the ground and taking my foot, set it upon his head. Thus it seemed was a token of swearing to be my slave forever. Atian sprang to his feet, a thundercloud wiping out all pleasure from his face. Nada, he shouted. Not so. Matt stopped, bewildered. Him never do that. Never do what? Never kneel down to white man. But Caruso had saved his life. Not kneel down, Atian repeated fiercely. Not be slave. Better die. Matt opened his mouth to protest, but Atian gave him no chance. In three steps, he was out the cabin. Now he'll never come back, Matt thought. He sat slowly, turning over the pages. He had never questioned that story. Like Robinson Crusoe, he had thought it natural and right that the wild man should be the white man's slave. Was there perhaps another possibility? The thought was new and troubling. And we'll read chapter 10 next time. Until then, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Thanks for listening. Love you guys. Bye-bye.